Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. Hello students, welcome back to the lecture series on women's writing and as you can see this is the 19th lecture and we are almost coming to the end of the series. There are a multiple things that we have discovered, we have discussed and we have tried to implement in many of the texts of this particular course. So throughout the journey that we have made so far, we have talked about how women have struggled against the patriarchal force. We have talked about how age old women right at the age of 88 is writing an autobiography. We have also seen how women have tried to deal with depression, have tried to deal with their inner conflicts, have tried to overcome the identities or uh, they have identities that have been thirst upon them by the male dominated society. So the identities of these women have always surrounded or has been revolving around other people who are supposedly to the male gender. These kind of things that we have already previously discussed also makes us think another thing which is what happens when we try to detach ourselves as women writers and women readers from this particular framework. What happens? What is that situation? Have any of the women writers ever faced that kind of situation? If yes, what are the consequences? Where, are, where has it taken them to? So in this lecture where we will be discussing elementary loneliness, vices and advices to women. So the vices, you see I have used two words, vices and advices. As you can see, vices are a word which are, an, vice is a word which is heavy with negative baggage. So there is something wrong or something evil or something bad which is associated with this word vice. And as you know, it, it can be also related to the religious domain that there are the good things in a person and there are the vices. So and if there are the vices, there are also advices. Some people also support, also give good advices to whoever carry these vices. To begin our discussion today, I have taken up something which apparently looks like not at all related to the field of loneliness. But I would like you to understand certain things. There are consequences of all the actions. You can always go and research the butterfly effect. There will be consequence to anything and everything. One action is always related to the other action which will again go on influencing the third action. It will work as a chain reaction and this chain reaction leads to an action or a happening which supposedly looks like nothing related to the primary action. But in this case, we will see how why feminism lost currency, this particular topic, how is it related to our topic today? That is elementary loneliness. See, what happened was that feminism lost currency. Of course, the phrase lost currency means fall out of use or you can say that has become obsolete, has become old, nobody is using this term nowadays. In the very first couple of lectures, you might have come across Adichie and I told you that Chimamanda Adichie, she has very eloquently said or uh, delivered to the public that what kind of idea people have about feminists and that is one of the reason that 
uh, feminists fell out of currency. People started developing the idea that women are men haters, they want to live alone and they want to go away from the social gatherings, they don't want to be represented, all sorts of things. They are unhappy women, they discard all the rules of the society. So, to this effect, what happened really, let us ha take a look at that. Feminism started being divided into all these parts. So, some group of women, they or men, of course, feminism is as we have discussed often that not strictly related to group of women, it is also, it has also been contributed to by men as well. But general idea is the, the participants in that kind of movement, they started breaking that up. Instead of uniting all the women, instead of promoting the air of sisterhood or womanhood, they started creating gaps based on class, based on caste, based on race, based on ethnicity, based on geographical parts. All of this caused feminism to be broken up into liberal feminism, radical feminism, Marxist feminism, socialist feminism, cultural, eco-feminism, global, post-structuralist, neoliberal, postmodern, and I. This is the latest one. Actually, in 2022, we have I feminism, which we will discuss as we come. So, let us consider this particular circle. It is a kind of land which has many, many people on it. And once you divide the land, you will have, okay, there is already a division, this particular line nobody will touch and the land will become smaller, a little bit smaller. Next, when you divide the land like this, this particular line will also take up some space, this particular line will also take up some space and this particular piece of land will be different from the this one and this one. Like this, if we start making further divisions, somebody created this particular division, then this particular division, then this particular division, this particular division. Every time you are dividing that particular land, what is happening is that these people who are roaming around in that uh, perfect space, they now have a limited space. Whoever wants to be in this land will not go into this land. The density will start increasing. Wherever these boundaries are, nobody is living on those boundaries. So, there is also a waste of land the, because those lands are used for creating a boundary. Whenever you find these kind of figures and you see these people are inside these boxes, these boxes, these boxes. So, feminism, this can be liberal feminists, these are the radical feminists, these are the social feminists, socialist feminists, cultural feminists, eco-critics, eco-feminists, global feminists, post-structural feminists. Everybody secured their own perimeter. Everybody started telling or showing to the world that we are different, we are individual, you must have a look at ourselves uh, as per belonging to this particular domain. I am a radical feminist, so I will do one particular thing. You are a liberal feminist, so your cause is different from my cause. She, on the other hand, is a Marxist feminist, so her point of view will be different from our point of view. This kind of problem, this kind of uh, segregation, this kind of separation started creating a lack of unity, that is lack of unity. It killed the unity, completely demolished the unity among the women because some were black feminists, some were white feminists, some were rich feminists, some were poor feminists. We, I have not included those terms over here. But these phrases did indeed appear in articles, newspapers, magazines, uh, theoretical tracts, everywhere you could see somebody calling other a particular label. So, 
these became the labels under which all the feminists tried to label themselves. When something like that happens, you are separated. You are separated and when you are separated, that means you will be cut off from the others. So, these people residing in this particular area, they are not talking to these people who are residing in this particular area. And these two people are not talking with this area residents. So, in this way, the separation that took effect created a kind of or a sense of alienation, segregation. And if you think that all these people on, on this particular piece of land, they were talking to each other, there also you are wrong. There also you might be wrong because some of these people can think that, oh, these people over there, I have something in common with them. So, that person will be always thinking that I belong to the cultural feminist, but I also have some qualities of the liberal feminists. So, shall I call myself a cultural feminist or shall I call myself a liberal feminist? Shall I go out in the street and talk about women's education and equal opportunity, everything or shall I go and talk or give lectures at cultural festivals and uh, gatherings where I will address the women and say that you are being manipulated, say that you are suffering from this and raise some sort of awareness that this culture is actually a male dominated culture and you must rise against this culture. What shall I do? What, sh what will be my standpoint? So, that particular person will not be feeling at home in either way, in either place. If she goes to the radical camp, she will feel that no, I am not that radical. I cannot go and shout at people. I cannot go and rally. I cannot go and uh, uh, burn certain books and uh, burn posters and everything. I would rather sit back and write about them and publish them. That is, that is something I choose to do. So, shall I call myself a radical feminist? Shall I call myself a liberal feminist? Shall I call myself a global feminist? Because I am travelling the globe. I want to travel the globe, but I do not have the means to do so. But I have the resources, the uh, the data, the research data which I am collecting uh, from all the uh, government aided websites and all the survey reports that are being issued under authority. I have all sorts of data. I can talk about global feminism, but I cannot go and uh, uh, collect my own data. What will I do? Where shall I go? So, that kind of turmoil within the mind of a feminist that kind of situational existentialism that whether I should exist in this situation or in that situation, whether I should exist within neoliberal feministic structure of mind or whether I should go and talk about nature and how women are an integral part of nature and encourage people to think on these terms. Why, where should my standing be? If I do not have any standing like that, isn't it obvious that we will feel lonely? We will feel abandoned, we will feel alone because nobody is there with whom I can share. If I belong to a certain camp, then I will always think that these people in this particular camp they have the same kind of idea and if I go and express that I have a different idea, they might throw me out of the camp. They might consider that I am not faithful to their cause. And the other camp which I was confirming to, they will not accept me thinking that you are from that camp. So, this kind of segregation, separation that happened at the time disintegrated the movement of feminism. So, now moving on to the next slide, we have the word called loneliness. Let us see what Merriam Webster dictionary talks about loneliness. Being without company, 
cut off from others, very innocent words where you just do not have a company, you just do not have somebody who is standing beside you, you do not have somebody not physically standing, of course it is metaphorically, somebody who is supporting you, you do not have a person who knows you inside out, you do not feel that if you use words to express your feelings then the other person the receiver will understand will interpret those words exactly in the same manner or with the same intent will decipher the same intent in it that you have originally expressed. You do not have that kind of faith because faith is of course something that is one nobody has been able to win your faith and you even if somebody has that person has broken it and now you feel that you are lonely. So, why are we talking about loneliness? Because if you go through the feminist literature other than the non-literary tracts, the claim for the rights, if you just go through the poems of Emily Dickinson, if you just read the stories by Catherine Mansfield, if you just take up the writings of Charlotte Perkins Gilman, you will find that there is an undercurrent of loneliness flowing through them. It is not, nobody says out loud that this is a, uh, I am feeling lonely, nobody says that. But if this is the text, this is the narrative if this is the narrative body of the text where things are happening, all the happening things, all the story is happening on this surface, then there is a turmoil of emotions below the text and that part we call the subtext. There is a turmoil of emotions, there is a tsunami of emotions and that emotion primarily originates from this particular loneliness. It is not only the authors but it is the narrators, the characters in those stories, those poems, those autobiographies that were written. We have already come across two autobiographies, one is by Rasundari Devi that is Amar Jibon translated as My Life and the other autobiography that we have also heard about is Kamala Das's My Story. Both are imbued with a lot of events where the narrator feels extremely lonely, feels that nobody can understand, nobody can comprehend the situation the narrator is in currently. So, there are two situations for women in our society, either she is married or she is unmarried. In case you are married, your loneliness will have a different kind of attribute different character of loneliness you will have. If you are unmarried, you will still have loneliness but of a different dimension. What kind is it? Let us take examples from the society, the general practices. A married woman when she wishes to work is denied that opportunity, she will feel that I am not I am not able to work and uh, I am not able to earn money, nobody gives me enough importance in the family, the husband does not care, the children do not care, what is my position? I am only a caregiver. If that is my position then I will not be able to express I wanted to pursue a career too, I wanted to earn money too, but I am denied that opportunity. All of these words and phrases are going on in the head in the head of the woman. She is not saying any of this to either the family members, to the husband, to the children. This is what we term as sacrifice that oh the woman has made a lot of sacrifice, the woman is happy I have made a lot of sacrifice. That is how women are conditioned in our society that you sacrifice for the growth of your children, you sacrifice for the prosperity of your husband. These are the turmoil situations and once you are in a married, uh, once you are married you will have, you will certainly 
be detached from your own family where you grew up, where everybody understood you, where you had the opportunity to quarrel and to put your views without being judged and even if they judged you, you didn't care because that's your own family, that's her own family. When she comes to a different family, first of all, she is cut off from her own family. Now, here also she feels cut off from herself because she is now doing the household work which she used, not used to do when she was back home. She is now re raising her children, she is now attending to her husband. These are the roles which, have, which the society have set for her, but she feels that this is something which is thirst upon her, this is not some, something she is doing willingly. This is one case, please make a note of it that this can not be uh, taken as a universal statement, it can obviously vary. What happens when you are unmarried? Your own family member, they se segregate you, they alienate you, they keep you somewhere else and say that oh you are unmarried you should not attend festivals, oh you are unmarried you are not a very good thing and of course I have not used the word widowed because the word widowed shows that uh, once you are widowed you do not have the capacity or the social sanction to marry again. So, I will also consider those women in this particular term unmarried that is they are not married anymore. Once they are married the husband dies let us consider they are unmarried and they can move on unless and until we bring this kind of approach into our discourse it is very difficult to move on. Separate prescriptions for lonelinesses, you can take up any literature from 100 years back. You will find that women who were unmarried, they were sent to either some holy place that you would stay there and support the cause of religion, who were widowed, they were equally sent to some holy place, you must stay there and you contribute to the glory of the God. But you shall not stay at home because if you are staying at home, it is uncomfortable for the family. Everybody will come and ask why is she not married or come and ask okay, it is so sad that she is widowed. This kind of bad things that have been thirst upon women, these are the vices of the society that women have been facing for so long and now we have the language problem when you are married into a different family from a different culture, they speak a different language, you do not feel at home in that kind of relationship also. The woman who married, who speaks suppose Kannar is married to a person who speaks Hindi, that woman will never feel at home unless and until they learn each other's languages. Once they learn each other's languages, it is quite possible that there can be options for reconciliation. But until that time, there will always be a sense of loneliness. Ethical values, somebody has been raised in a family where you have somebody who is a non-vegetarian, if that person is married to a vegetarian family, the vegetarian family is likely to say that your ethical values are bad because you are killing animals. But the person who has been raised with the diet of the non-veg uh, that is being consumed on a daily basis in their house, that person does not identify how can this be possible, how can you say like that, I am as good and pious as everybody else, it is only the food that is non-veg and it is part of our culture, it is a part of our food habit, natural food habit. How can you say that this is bad and you are unethical and you are immoral, you are cruel. When a person who is apparently none, who has apparently none of these qualities is shown and displayed and judged on the basis of their food habit, that creates a kind of divide. And again the woman, if uh, this woman is going to suffer just because she is a non-vegetarian married into a vegetarian family, then 
either she will have to she will be forced to give up her diet or the other person if that person the husband is willing or good enough that person will accept that. But this is a process this is still relevant today. Next is estrangement. Estrangement is a little bit related to the cause of the unmarried women. You are familiar with your family, you know your mother, you know your father, you know your sister, your brother, everybody. But suddenly at after a particular age if you are not married, they start acting differently. They continuously poke at your unmarried self. They ask you whether you are married, whether you are unmarried. And uh, of course, this is your uh, friends, your relatives, they come and ping you that you are not marrying, is something the wrong? You tell us, we will find a groom for you. And you find these people who used to encourage me to study, who used to encourage that particular woman, that particular lady, that particular spinster to have a career suddenly has switched sides. Now they are concerned that the woman is not marrying, it is a problem in the society. So, these kind of this becomes a part of the estrangement that you find your own people strangers, you have never seen these people before. You have seen these people, but not with this kind of voice, this kind of words and these kind of sentences coming out from their mouth. Mary Hardy wrote a very nice paper on this about the facts of loneliness. She says that loneliness in women's writing used as the expression of inequality of social roles. So, women's writing whenever has tried to take up the idea or deal with the idea of loneliness, they have unmistakably considered the social roles that we have been discussing so far. What are the roles of women, how the society expresses these roles, prescribes these roles and encourages everybody to aspire to be a role model. That is something they have been trying for so long. Now, here is a poem by Kamala Das. We will read it very quickly so that we will be able to move forward and consider other works of literature also. And we will try to analyze how the feeling of loneliness comes, whether is it a happy kind of loneliness, it is a sad kind of loneliness, if the author is trying to deal with loneliness by writing this poem, all these variations appear in this particular part of this lecture. What is this drink but the April sun squeezed like an orange in my glass, I sip the fire. I drink and drink, again I am drunk, yes but on the gold of suns, what noble venom now flows through my veins and fills my mind with unhurried laughter. My worries doze, we bubble string my glass like a bride's nervous smile and meet my lips, dear forgive this moment's lull in wanting you, the blur in memory, how brief the term of my devotion, how brief your reign. When I with glass in hand drink, drink and drink again this juice of April suns. This is the poem and you might have noticed I have used a highlighter for this small i. In the starting lines of this poem you will see the i is capital. So, the author over here she is trying to deal with the kind of loneliness in herself, Ki the, the fact that she has been abandoned by people, she does not feel all right, she is not okay is very much evident from this particular word my worries. When she is saying my worries, we know there are certain things in her mind which are actually not letting her stay on her own. So, she is drinking the juice of an orange, but this is a metaphorical orange, this is actually the April sun. And April sun and that also in Calcutta, let me tell you is not a very good thing. It is a very sweaty kind of situation, it is very hot and humid. You will find that this kind of situation a person is not very comfortable in. So, that person here is the narrator, she is having some worries on her own 
and she is roaming around in the streets. That is what this is about. You cannot filter the sun and drink it like a juice. Because she is worried, she is roaming around in the heat of the sun. And whenever you are roaming around in the heat of the sun with some worries on your head, of course you will feel dizzy. And this dizziness is slowly taking away the worries from you. Because the physical pain, the physical discomfort is so much so that the mental discomfort is going away slowly. It is a very natural thing that when a person is under physical discomfort, that person will start acting in a way so as to stay fit and the body will react in such a way so that the other problems, the mental problems will be reduced automatically. So, whatever the worries the narrator have, these worries are being taken care of by the heat of the April sun. Dear, forgive this moment's lull in wanting you. This is one of the worries because at this point of time, I would really like to have a conversation. We do not know who this you is. Perhaps it is a lover, perhaps it is a companion, just a companion. But this author, the narrator over here, the one who is requesting a company, that person is also asking for forgiveness that I just want you at this particular time, the blur in memory because there might have been something which has happened before and for which the author did not want to meet that person. Now, since the memory has been blurred by the discomfort, the worries, the problems, the quarrels, whatever has happened, everything has been subdued by the discomfort the narrator is experiencing under the heat of the sun. Everything has been reduced to a minimum pitch. Now, what arises out of it? That her expression that she wants the companion back. So, moving on to the next poem by Eunice de Souza. We talked about Eunice de Souza before and uh, you can go back and have a look at the lecture. Advice to women. This is actually the title of the poem, Advice to Women. Keep cats. We have already discussed this poem but in a different vein. Today we will try to judge the loneliness, the strain of separation like we saw in Kamala Das, the wanting, the need to be with somebody and how that is happening just because of the heat and how it is affecting the memory. We studied that just right now. So, we will see what is up with Eunice D'Souza. Keep cats if you want to learn to cope with the otherness of lovers. It is a very intriguing line, the otherness of lovers. What is the meaning? What can be? What is the otherness? The lover, it is mine. The lover is mine. Why the otherness of lovers? Is the lover a part or parcel of anybody else's life also? It is quite possible that whoever is the narrator or the author of the poem has been jilted in love, has been cheated upon and she feels that kind of segregation within herself, loneliness, abandonment within herself and she suggests that keep cats. If you want to learn to cope with the otherness of lovers, if the lovers go distant, they go away from you, you cannot cope with that kind of uh, loneliness, it is better you keep some cats with you. Otherness is not always neglect. Now, this person is describing what this word here means. Otherness is not always neglect. That means it is neglect, but not always. Cats return to their litter trays when they need to. The litter trays are where the cats defecate, where they relieve themselves. So, whenever the cats need to defecate, they will come back to their litter trays. They will defecate over there and that is where they are supposed to. So, is not it very ironic that the woman here, the lover here or the beloved here thinking of the cats that, that at least they will come back when they just need to answer the nature's call. 
but the lovers they don't. Don't cuss out of the window at their enemies. If the lovers have some enemies, if people are there who are trying to support you, don't curse at them. That stare of perpetual surprise in those great green eyes will teach you to die alone. This, those great green eyes are the eyes of the cats. The stare of perpetual surprise, when you look into the eyes of the cats, every time you will see that whenever they look into your eyes, they are perpetually surprised. This is how the author is trying to describe the look of the cats. The cats are surprised all the time and they will teach you to die alone. That means death is also a surprise and you will die very peacefully because you will be dying alone without the otherness of lovers but the cats who will be your company they will teach you how to prepare for death because they their looks are always surprised because they see the surprises in life and death of course as we know is the ultimate surprise references to this are can be found in abundance in uh, the epic Mahabharata. So, this particular thing is an advice to a woman, maybe by a woman, maybe the author herself accepts the fact that I am a woman and I have been jilted in love. Whenever I could not cope, I brought cats and the cats have always given me company. They have taken away the moments of loneliness from me. They have, when I am of course surprised that they have left, but death is a su bigger surprise because I am not still ready to die and I am going to die alone. This is not surprise, this is frightening because I will not have any companion. I have been jilted in this uh, particular area, but if you keep cats, they will keep you company and you can die a peaceful death. Of course, if you look at it, it is just an advice to a woman, but this advice is coming from a broken heart and that heart is very lonely and when one person is trying to give you advice, it is of course psychologically very true that that person is also looking for a response that you will come and say, please your advice is good, please tell me something more and you will then try to contribute more. This is a very natural tendency of human beings. So, this piece of advice is like starting a conversation with somebody else because that person has nobody to converse with. This is the underlying current, this is the undercurrent of loneliness that is flowing through the text. Next is another poem, Bequest by the same poet. In every Catholic home, there is a picture of Christ holding his bleeding heart in his hand. I used to think, ah, the only person with whom I have not exchanged confidences is my hairdresser. Some recommended stern standards, others say float along. He says take it as it comes, meaning of course as he hands it out. I wish I could be a wise woman smiling and lessly vacuously like a plastic flower saying, child learn from me, it is time to perform an act of charity to myself, bequeath the heart like a spare kidney preferably to an enemy. When we read these lines, one thing is very sure that the person is ruminating or reflecting on whatever experiences she had through her life. She starts with the invocation of the Catholic home. The primary seat of learning for a person is the home that a person grows up in and in this case it is a Catholic home, there is a picture of the Christ, there is a cross at the wall, she sees that Christ holding his bleeding heart in his hand and it she Christ is giving that heart to everybody. So, one person giving one's bleeding heart to everybody, this particular imagery stuck to the author's mind. Why? Because maybe that person has done the same. 
she has learned that this is what Christ had been doing. Maybe she has also given her heart to somebody like that. I used to think, ah. So she used to think that, but maybe not now. Her perceptions right at this point might have changed. The only person with whom I have not exchanged confidences is my hairdresser. That means I have given my heart to most of the people I have met throughout my life. Maybe the hairdresser who takes care of my hair, who cuts my hair, shapes my hair and asks me to keep quiet otherwise uh, my hair is, uh, my head will move. Only that person I have not given my heart to. And here giving the heart does not mean falling into a romantic relationship with that person. It means to generally empathize, to love everybody. This is what the rule or the basic commandment of Christianity is, love everybody as your own self. So she has been loving everybody, giving her heart to everybody around her, maybe except the hairdresser. Some recommended stern standards, others say float along. So in order to move on in the life, she said, in order to move on from this kind of situation, she was advised by other people that you must keep standards, you must not give your heart to everybody. And others say, you just float along with it, no need to worry, you can do whatever you want. He says, take it as it comes. Now he can be either the hairdresser, he can also be Christ. Let us see what the poem, how the poem unfolds. Meaning of course, he hands it out. So whenever Jesus is trying to give you the heart, you take it as it comes to you. So if you don't have a heart, if you have lost your heart and you feel lonely because you have been distributing your heart to all the people around you, at that point of time, you might be thinking this is the right thing to do. But at this point of time, you see that you have given all of your heart to all the people you have met and you don't have anybody. So Jesus says, take it as it comes. So I am giving you my heart right now. It is coming to you. You take it from here. I wish I could be a wise woman. She has some regrets. She of course, all of us has regrets and that is where we connect to the author. Whenever there is a poem, there will be certain lines which connects the author with the reader. So this is one of those lines. I wish I could be a wise woman. She does not say that I wish I could have been a boy or a man. She says a wise woman, smiling endlessly, vacuously like a plastic flower saying, child, learn from me. So I wish I can give my experience to all the women out there. I wish I could have been wise enough and impart whatever knowledge I have gathered about human heart and human heartlessness. I wish I could have given it all to the people around me, smiling endlessly, even if I have suffered long and forever I would still smile vacuously, although my smile will be empty because this smile does not have the heart in it. Like a plastic flower, the plastic flower is equally as beautiful as the original flower, but it does not have the smell or the texture of the original flower. Saying, child, learn from me. So for Jesus, all of us are children, his children. Here we see that I wish I could be a wise woman, smiling endlessly, vacuously like a plastic flower, saying, child, learn from me. We have already discussed these lines and moving forward to the next one, it's time to perform an act of charity to myself. So right now, the act of charity, like charity begins at home. We have already talked about the first place where a child starts learning. And this particular home over here, this child is, has grown up seeing the picture of uh, Jesus Christ, statues, crosses and Jesus holding out his heart. 
it is time to perform an act of charity that same charity now going to be manifest that whatever that child has learned right from its childhood the woman has learned right from its from her childhood that particular thing is going to be repeated at this point of time to myself this charity is not directed towards anybody outside this charity will be done to myself because i am in need of charity i have been giving out my heart to anybody and everybody that comes so now at this point i am in need of charity because that particular vacuum is within me bequeaths the heart like a spare kidney preferably to an enemy so this heart that i have i have been giving it out for everybody now let me give it to an enemy let me bequeath it to an enemy whatever the person whoever are against me at till now i was thinking everybody was in for in favor of me everybody is supporting me and but right now i am taking it i am considering this fact that instead of considering everybody as friends let me consider them enemies that way i will be at peace that whoever whoever i gave my heart to is also an enemy and i will not suffer because i will not expect any kind of reconciliation any kind of reciprocation that from that person we have already studied this poem and i will only go over it very briefly here the idea of the wife of marriage and this particular institution is looking down upon down upon the spinster those who are not married the unmarried women this is the subject matter of the poem but is it really what emily dickinson lived like no she did not marry herself and she knows very well what kind of thing company is whether she needs a company she does not need a company whatever the discussions that have happened i am wife i finished that she has moved on the that other state the state of being married i am zar i am woman now it's safer so so this thing has given her a kind of identity has given her a kind of status in the society she is now the zar she is in power she is the complete woman once she is married because she has a company how odd the girl's life looks behind this soft eclipse i think that earth feels so to folks in heaven this is the loneliness that emily dickinson's life is filling up with because she is in the earth and the married women are in the heaven although she is now reversing the chairs reversing the table and wanting to be the wife have a companion but she is at that point she is looking down upon the other women who did not have the chance to get a companion this being comfort then that other kind was pain but why compare i am wife stop there now here again there is this we are thinking here that emily dickinson is supporting marriage supporting companionship and she is looking down upon the spinsters over here that was the situation till now but the last line i am wife stop there shows something very different it shows that now my whole being has become wife i am not an individual person anymore i cannot take my own decisions anymore now i am becoming the prescribed nature of woman in the society i have become a wife nothing more than that i am not a person anymore this feeling of alienation from our own self whoever is married whoever has or is going to marry that person feels the similar kind she is not talking about the fruitfulness of marriage she is saying the both the halves both the conditions of women are equally painful if if it is a spinster that spinster thinks that i do not have company if it is a married woman the wife she becomes a wife 
she does not remain the girl, the woman, the lady she used to be. That way she is estranged from her own self. This is a very short poem by Dickinson. Silence is all we dread. There is ransom in a voice, but silence is infinity, himself have not a face. So here we see, we are coming to the first sentence of the first line of the poem, silence is all we dread. We dread these silences because if I do not have company, even of my own self, then I am in trouble. Because men are social beings, women are social beings, everybody has some sort of equation with each other in a social reality. And if that reality suddenly stops interacting with you, but you have grown up in a society where you have been addicted to interactions, you have been addicted to talking to each other. And at this point, you are seeing that there is no scope for that. That is something which is dreadful. That is something which we are afraid of. We are afraid of loneliness. There is ransom in a voice. Somebody if talks to us, we feel that we are getting a huge amount of money only for letting go of the silence of the problems in our life. A ransom is something which is associated to kidnapping. If you are kidnapped, you pay the ransom and then the kidnapper lets you go. So here with the voice, you are paying the ransom and the silence is gone. But silence is infinity. Silence is greater than us. If you think that by talking to somebody, you have chased away silence, you have gotten rid of the silence and you are no longer within the perimeters of the silence, then you are wrong. Because silence is infinity, it is everywhere. There is no end to it. Only what is finite is noise, what is finite is the words, the sounds that we are making. Himself have not a face. They don't have a face. The particular perimeter, the space, the time, they do not make noise. We make noise. So space and time do not have a face. Do not have eyes, ears, nose, mouth to create any kind of distraction, any kind of noise, any kind of input. All they have is silence. This is another poem by Dickinson. The loneliness one dare not sound and would as soon surmise as in its grave no plumbing to ascertain the size. Whenever there is loneliness, we feel afraid and whenever we are thinking of death, that grave go plumbing to ascertain the size, we, whenever we feel sad, upset, lonely, we think of death and what kind of grave we will have, what will be the size of that. The loneliness whose worst alarm is lest itself should see and perish from before itself for just a scrutiny. The loneliness whose worst alarm is lest itself should see. The loneliness must not be aware that it is lonely. Whenever you are aware that you are lonely, you will go and try, uh, try to find a company. You will try to emerge out of your problems. But one who is lonely rarely does that, rarely takes that kind of option into consideration. They go into depression and perish from before itself for just a scrutiny. If somebody comes and looks, oh, are you lonely? At that very moment, the loneliness is gone because somebody has talked to you, somebody has come to you. A mere scrutiny, a mere, mere curiosity can kill loneliness. The horror not to be surveyed but skirted in the dark with consciousness suspended and being under lock. If you are under lock and your horror, the horror of loneliness is not to be surveyed. You must not go and survey what are the depths of loneliness, what are the pains that loneliness inflict on your mind. But skirted in the dark, it should be kept away in the dark with consciousness suspended and being under locked. Your consciousness becomes numb. You only think of one thing that you are abandoned, you are lonely. You cannot make any logical deductions and your mind does not think clearly. It only weighs itself down with the, with the weight of loneliness. I fear me this is loneliness, the maker of the soul, its caverns and its corridors illuminate or seal. So now in the last line, we have a very interesting comment. 
the makers of the soul why is loneliness considered the makers of the soul because at loneliness when you are alone you can contemplate you can meditate you can have your peace of solitude that is either will illuminate yourself will illumine your inner self or it can seal yourself you can go into depression if you are able to control your emotions during that phase you can either rise as a wiser person or you can deteriorate your mental state can go down badly so with these lines we have come to the end of this lecture and we see that whenever the concept of loneliness has been taken up there is always a relationship with the family members that has been uh, addressed with the husbands with the lovers everywhere women as a companion is needing another person it is quite natural it is not unfeministic let me tell you if you think that this is against the feminist rules that identity should always should never dwell on male figures but we must also think of the fact that if it does it's not wrong because a woman after all she believes that and in all her right we if she does not accept that fact that i am a separate being as proper philosophers as well wishers to that particular woman we must allow her that choice women's writing is about expressions it is not about expressions of slavery and alienation all the time it is sometimes about the expression of being loved loved by anybody and it is quite natural so with these words i end this lecture and uh, i ask you to go back and revise all the lectures that we have come through so that the upcoming lecture which is on cyborgs you will be able to connect what has been different in the field of women's writing for and the at the arrival of the cyborg class of human beings thank you very much see you next lecture understanding oneself understanding others understanding society at large understanding the nature these are all driven by basic human curiosity we would all love to understand why things happen what happens what is the final outcome why certain things fail these are all exercises that we perform in various domains of knowledge therefore knowledge in various domains you would realize they are actually social artifacts they have to be rooted into historical perspective they have to be culturally salient and there would be socio political reasons behind this you are trying to understand why despite knowing the risk that is inbuilt in the process why still human beings engage into it you are looking at it from a pure behavioral point of view why society at large admire things which has full of risk you are trying to understand things from a pure sociological point of view why people use particular uh, set of words to explain those experiences you are trying to understand things from the linguistic point of view so there are whole lot of things and then finally you try to combine all of them to say that what are the guiding principles in life then you say you are looking at life you are looking at humanity from a pure philosophical point of view and this is what social sciences courses provide you they provide the context to you in which you would be finally positioning the understanding of the knowledge in any given domain it could be engineering it could be sciences it could be medical sciences it could be social sciences stuff it could be humanities stuff so con contextualizing the knowledge 
is what humanities social science courses help you obtain.